of the participants whom we fully respect. Good afternoon, all. Welcome to the Science and Innovative Technology discussion today. Firstly, I want to introduce myself. My name is Desi Putri Handayani as a moderator for this discussion today. And today we have a very interesting topic and the topic is about fisheries sustainability in the climate change era. As we know that climate change is expected to make the situation of sustainable fisheries governance even more urgent and critical. However, the full implications of climate change for international trade of fish and fisheries products are well known and required for the study. Today we have three speakers and they are Mrs. Luen Kilox PSD and the second speaker is Imam Suhada PSD and the last speaker is Mr. Suadi PSD and each for each speaker will present around 20 minutes and after that I will open for Q&A sections and all of the participants can ask direct to the speakers or write in the text box in the below of the monitor while the presentation is starting. Before I start this discussion, there is a welcome speech from Dr. Jam Hari as a Dean of Agriculture Faculty. For Dr. Jam Hari, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your timing for me, uh, everybody. A good uh, afternoon. Uh, so firstly, on behalf of Faculty of Agriculture, I would like to welcome and express our sincerely thanks to Dr. Gilux, uh, Dr. Imam Shuhada, and also Dr. Swadi uh, for your time uh, to share uh, your uh, research uh, finding and also experience regarding the fishery sustainability in the climate change uh, era. As we know that uh, really uh, fishery maybe will uh, be affected more by the climate change since the temperature of the ocean increase and sometimes uh, the water availability also change due to the climate change. So uh, I think uh, sustainability of fishery and how we cope with this uh, big change is very important uh, to provide uh, food uh, from the ocean. For the uh, from the fishery and uh, of course uh, the faculty of agriculture um, uh, appreciate uh, this activity for the third uh, webinar uh, conducted by uh, organized by the uh, study program of uh, master of science in fishery so uh, we hope that this activity uh, can be continued in the future uh, of course uh, we respond the uh, new aspect or the current uh, challenges challenge uh, in uh, fishery and we can adopt in our education uh, because uh, as the master uh, program uh, we give more attention on the research so it's mean that uh, we have to um, al always uh, correct uh, and match our uh, research uh, team with the uh, condition uh, of the real condition and the, our challenge, uh, climate change and, and other. Once again, uh, thank you very much for our uh, speakers and also uh, participants. Uh, we hope this um, in the future, maybe if the in the Department of Fishery, we have the international seminar. So in this uh, webinar uh, series also, I think uh, almost always international speakers also join to our activity. So I think this is a very good point uh, to increase, uh, to get uh, new experience, as, especially in this occasion uh, from uh, Dr. Kilux and also uh, Pa Imam Suheta, I think uh, also will give uh, more value uh, how the practice, practice or uh, reality uh, fishery. Uh, okay, I think uh, this I can um, uh, say in this occasion, uh, once again, thank you very much, and please continue this uh, webinar. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamhari, for welcome speech. And I think everyone can wait to hear the presentation from the first speaker. So I will keep the time to the first speaker, Mrs. Buen Kilox. And she will present about ocean and climate interaction in international law. She is a postdoctoral research fellow within the inter interdisciplinary graduate school from the Blue Planet IS Blue at the laboratory IMURE, France. For Mrs. Bluen, time is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I will now share my presentation. Can you hear me properly? Yes? Yes, clear. So yes. Now I can start. Yes, properly. And can you see the presentation properly too? My slide? Yes? Yeah, it's good. Selamat uh, pagi, siang or story, depending on your time zone. I hope my accent is fine. Thank you. Or I must say terima kasih to the fisheries department and uh, the faculty of agriculture of the Yogyakarta University for inviting me to join this webinar. This is really an honor. I met some of the fellow members of the department back in 2018. They warmly welcomed me and the other participants to the Inverse Summer School. It was an unforgettable, fruitful experience. I'm looking forward to further collaborating with you. This presentation today is based on a legal paper entitled Ocean and Climate Regime Interactions, published last July in the Ocean Yearbook. I will give you an overview of the results I obtain in terms that I hope will be not too abstract for non-lawyers in particular. In the following presentation, and especially in pre preliminary remarks, I will explain what are the interactions between ocean and climate systems from a natural sciences perspective and how these interactions are reflected into international law. The first part will be dedicated to the incidental consideration of climate change in the law of the sea. In the second part, I will show that the consideration of the ocean in climate international law is incremental. Throughout this presentation, I will do my best to illustrate my remarks with examples relevant for Indonesia. As the largest archipelagic state in the world, Indonesia plays a key role in creating synergies between ocean and climate actions. I will also do my best to avoid the use of acronyms, but if it is the case, they would be made understandable in the corresponding slides. As for the legal terms, please know that I will use the word regime and law indistinctly, even if they, if they do not have exactly the same meaning. Regime has a broader meaning that international law, um, that means the rules of internal, uh, um, uh, uh, the rules, sorry, of the rights and duty binding on and formulated by states and international organizations. Regime stems from international relations and refer to loosely coupled sets of norms, decision making procedures, and organization coalescing around functional issues such as climate or ocean issues. So, uh, some other preliminary remarks concern the history and the scientific and environmental framework in which this legal study takes place. I will only recall the main milestones here because you certainly know more about it than I do. The ocean has long been used by scientists as a key component of the climate system to show that human activities, especially the indiscriminate burning of fossil fuels, fuels sorry, have resulted in unequivocal, accelerated and unprecedented alteration of our planet. In 1957 already, the American scientists Revelle and Suez wrote, I quote, I quote that within a century, we are returning to the atmosphere and ocean, the concentrated organic carbon stored in sedimentary rocks over hundreds of millions of years. In the late 70s, early 80s, 
enough scientific evidence had been gathered to leave no reasonable doubt. Since then, the senseless use of natural resources has continued, leading to the present climate crisis. According to the EPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a special report on the ocean and the cryosphere in a changing climate published in, 19, in, in 2019, the response of the ocean to past and current human-induced greenhouse gas emissions is irreversible on a human scale. The global ocean is and will be seriously affected by multiple disruptions in its physical, chemical, and biological dimensions. The three key climate-induced drivers impacting the ocean system are ocean warming, acidification, and deoxygenation. Consequent impacts comprise sea level rise, disruption of ocean water masses and currents, loss of polar ice and glaciers, biodiversity depletion, and extreme weather events. In Indonesia and all around the world, actual and forthcoming consequences on human societies, their livelihoods, health, and security are severe. At the current rate, global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052 and will likely persist for centuries to millennia, causing further long-term changes in the climate system. For limiting global warming to well below 2 degrees, as set in the Paris Agreement, CO2 emissions must decline by about 25% by, by 2030, and reach net zero emission around 2070. If humanity achieves to do so, it will only have to negotiate the extinction of world's tropical reefs or sea level rise of several meters. But if the ocean is negatively impacted by climate change, it also plays a key role in mitigating its effect by, for example, absorbing excess CO2 and heat. Such capacity of passive absorption, which benefits humankind, is variable and non-unlimited. As we have just seen, the strong social ecological interactions between ocean and climate systems explain why ocean and climate interaction in international law are, are highly desirable and urgent. Yet, the state of international law differs from the state of science. Both ocean and climate regimes are loosely coupled. On one hand, the law of the sea, and especially the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, can be characterized as a comprehensive framework governing all major human activities conducted for peaceful purposes in the whole ocean, divided into zones within and beyond national jurisdiction, where the rights and duties of states are carefully balanced. Under the uni unified legal framework of the UNCLOS, UN, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, a broad range of specific topics has been supplemented by several sectoral and regional arrangements, such as fisheries agreements. On the other hand, the climate regime can be characterized as a regime complex. That means an array of partially overlapping and non-hierarchical institutions governing climate, with at its, at, at its core the 1992 United Conventions, a framework convention on climate change, providing the framework for stabilizing greenhouse gases and atmospheric concentrations. It's 1997 Kyoto Protocol, setting quantified emission limitation and reduction commitments for developed parties only, and the 2015 Paris Agreement, specifying the UNFCCC, so the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, specifying its ultimate objective by setting precise temperature goals for all parties. Besides the UN treaty-based regime, the climate regime complex is prone to virtually integrate new regimes or to coordinate or cooperate with other regimes and fields of international law, such as human rights or the law of the sea. But for now, both climate and ocean regimes only intersect, overlap, and occasionally collaborate. 
Throughout my study, I have observed four types of interactions that are proving useful to creating more coherence and efficiency within and across ocean and climate law. Firstly, epistemic and cognitive interaction. This is the case of the work of the IPCC, providing best relevant scientific knowledge within the climate regime, but also used by professionals within the ocean regime. Secondly, technical interactions stemming from legal techniques such as treaty interpretation and treaty drafting. I will give you examples afterwards. Thirdly, normative inter interactions that could be, for example, the use of meta norms such as sustainable development goals to find connection between ocean and climate regime. And finally, institutional interaction taking place through coordination and cooperation between international uh, organizations, treaty bodies, and mechanisms. So this is also the case of regional fisheries management organization while they are addressing uh, fisheries in the era of climate change. These four types of interaction are rather complementary and mutually exclusive. Bearing them in mind, we will now study in more details to what extent ocean and climate regime interacts. So let's start with the law of the sea and how it can be related to climate-related issues. The consideration of climate change within the law of the sea, and especially the UNCLOS, is incidental. That is not surprising since the so-called Constitution for the Ocean was negotiated at a time, the third UN conference on the law of the sea between 1973 and 1982, when climate change was not on the international political agenda. At first glance, the reduction of greenhouse gases to protect and preserve the marine environment falls outside its scope. But by using, by using legal techniques, such as treaty interpretation, the UNCLOS shall be, however, interpreted and applied in good faith, considering any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the party, between states, and that includes climate law. Without going into legal details, the primary interpretative links between ocean and climate regime regimes operate through unclosed provisions on the protection and preservation of the marine environment. For example, ocean warming, along with the uptake of CO2 in the water column causing acidification, can be considered as a marine pollution, as they respectively involve the introduction of energy and substances with deleterious effects. Through another type of technique of uh, regime interaction, which is uh, treaty drafting, it would be also desirable, also still unpredictable, that the future legally binding instrument under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity beyond national jurisdictions so or in international areas, it would be really desirable that the this uh, negotiated agreement will incorporate some in, some in some of its provisions climate-related data or even objectives. But the fact that the UNCLOS and other sectorial uh, or regional ocean-related agreements can underpin in a mutually supportive manner international climate law is heavily dependent on enhanced cooperation and coordination between states and international organizations within and beyond the ocean regime to guarantee synergic decision-making and implementation. For now, there have been few substantial institutional interactions in the law of the sea directed at the effect of climate change on the ocean, if so, even those few attempts have been ill-adapted, that means approached in a fragmented way due to overlapping, overlapping institutional mandates and gaps in coverage. The two major modes of inter institutional interplays rely on cognitive and epistemic interactions. This is the case in the fishery sector, prediction on ships owing to climate change, 
uh, in the in ocean temperature, acidity and currents have been made, but scientific knowledge remains uncertain. Besides, there is a reluctance of regional fisheries management organization to incorporate certain scientific ideas, such as adaptive management, into decision making. However, some RFMOs recently expressed their interest in the use of fishery forecast and enhanced understandings on liquid linkages between climate variables and fish stocks condition for development of conservation measures. Additionally, additionally more RFMOs are under an obligation to take precautionary measures. Let's draw now rapidly our attention on how the ocean is considered in climate law. This consideration is incremental. That means that climate law keeps its essential feature unchanged while denoting small synergy, synergetic changes toward addressing the relations between ocean and climate. Apart from the explicit mention of possible adverse effects of sea level rise on islands and coastal areas in its preamble and of integrated plans for coastal zone management in Article 4, the UNFCCC apprehends the ocean mainly through the narrow but significant prism of sinks and reservoirs of greenhouse gases. As for the Kyoto Protocol, it gives mandate to the International Maritime Organization to take specific mitigation measures in this sectoral area. In both treaties, the extent to which ocean and marine ecosystems can be conserved and enhanced as greenhouse gases sinks and reservoirs remains vague and softly worded without further detailed provisions or reference to the unclosed or other relevant agreements. This can partially be explained by the broad scope of the UNFCCC and the fact that the UN climate negotiations have traditionally focused on land-based greenhouse emissions in the atmosphere. No account is made by parties for the excess carbon naturally absorbed by the ocean. The Paris Agreement acknowledged, however, a renewal of how the ocean is considered by climate law, since the ocean are, expi are explicitly mentioned as such in its preamble, in, especially in recital 13. This recital responds to a long-standing concern that marine biodiversity and ecosystem integrity risks are not sufficiently considered by parties when taking climate action. Such a clause can assume a function of integration or of conflict avoidance with the ocean regime. It remains nevertheless essentially political without any legal concrete effects. Like the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement is elusive about ocean-related issues, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation. Um, I would just give you the example of adaptation measures that are proven to be an important theme for, theme for several biodiversity, fishery, and regional seas instruments. Parties uh, in Article 7 recognize that adaptation is a multi-scale global challenge and a key component of the long-term global response to climate change to protect people, livelihoods, and ecosystems, particularly in vulnerable developing countries. Also, the wording is soft. Again, adaptation action can serve as a common denominator between ocean and climate regime. But if not addressed deeply in treaty provisions, ocean appears to be an emerging political and institutional topic within the climate regime. For a long time, national delegates generally demonstrated a lack of political will to put ocean-related issues on the political agenda because it will bring highly contested issues among parties, such as funding and technology transfer. Before COP15, however, the AOCs, Alliance of Small Island States plus Indonesia Group, expressed the will to put blue carbon ecosystems such as mangroves into the climate debate. At COP21, some already active groups of states, along with states and non-state actors, advocated ocean-related issues. 
Their goal were to raise awareness of climate risk in the ocean and coastal areas to influence the outcome of climate conference of parties and to foster ocean and climate regime interactions. Following the request made by governments in 2016 to the IPCC to prepare a special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate, such hybrid mainstreaming gained in intensity. Recurrent dedicated ocean days and ocean-related side events have been since then organized alongside official climate negotiation. It also leads to the formulation of programmatic orientation, such as a roadmap to ocean and climate action, the because the ocean declarations, and so on. The COP25 was envisioned by the Chilean president at the blue, as the Blue COP, which could serve as a political momentum to oceanize the climate debate and address the ocean and climate nexus in a more integrated manner. This hope was somehow disappointed to do, due to the opposition of so, some states, such as Brazil, Saudi Arabia, and the Russian Federation, to refer to the oceans in the Chile-Madrid time of action. State nevertheless requested the subsidiary body for scientific and technical advice to the UNFCCC to convene at its next meeting a dialogue on the ocean and climate change to consider how, how to reinforce mitigation and adaptation actions. State and non-states were invited to send submissions to feed the dialogue. In its submission, Indonesia considers that the dialogue should cover exchange of information, experiences, challenges, and best practices in ocean-based adaptation and mitigation, and mitigation on increasing coastal community resilience toward climate change impacts or on protecting key coastal and near-shore marine ecosystems that are vulnerable to climate change impacts such as mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs. Indonesia also invites the dialogue to cover gaps and opportunities of ocean climate actions on different regimes inside and outside the UNFCCC, so the climate law. Uh, it also finally invites to cover gaps and options for cooperation and scientific findings and data sharing, especially on open ocean and high seas. In addition to the further uh, ocean dialogue, which was postponed due to a uh, COVID-19 crisis, the consideration of ocean-related issue has also been done through strategic work stream for science, adaptation and resilience, and pre-2020 ambition and implementation. To conclude really quick, in the absence of a systematic view at international level, also reflected at regional and national levels, ocean and climate interactions uh, can be characterized as ambivalent. This ambivalence uh, mostly lies in the approaches followed, for, ex for example, the prominence sometimes given to mitigation in comparison to adaptation or to the conservation of marine biodiversity. Furthermore, scientific and political uncertainty prevent a clear-cut assessment. For example, uh, blue carbon, that is the use of marine ecosystems such as wetlands, mangroves, and seagrass meadows to capture carbon, could result in socio-ecological problem shifting by further externalizing the cost of climate change mitigation to natural marine sinks and reservoirs. One response to the challenge of, of fragmented ocean and climate action is to accommodate the imperative within the domestic sphere via the inclusion of ocean-related action in their nationally determined contribution. So this is action under the Paris Agreement. States can manage ocean and climate regime interaction by supporting their um, in an autonomous fashion, the connectivity between ocean and climate law. 
It remains that the strong interdependency between ocean and climate collapsing systems raise numerous forthcoming challenges for both ocean and climate international laws. Beyond slow or is insufficiently rapid political and legal evolutions, it is urgent to drastically reduce greenhouse gases emissions, especially for historical emitters. But to do so, capacity building as well as a collective spirit is paramount. Terima kasih. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it is very important and very nice presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Pluem. And we will continue to the second speaker, Mr. Shu, Imam Shuhaja. And we will deliver, and he will deliver Indonesian tuna, advancing management towards sustainable fisheries. He has finished his doctoral biological and environment, environmental science in Rhode Island University. And now he works on the International Pool and Line Foundation. For Mr. Imam Shuhada, time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Desi. Um, uh, hopefully uh, you are hearing my voice and also see my presentation. Uh, now, um, please uh, confirm if you can hear me and if you can see also my presentation. Yes, perfect, please. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so, um, for today's presentation, I would like to, uh, again, um, try to, uh, basically going small, um, um, trying to uh, bring the uh, participant to know more about Indonesian tuna and then later on and how Indonesian tuna contributes to the uh, to the world uh, as a as, uh, so to supply the uh, protein uh, and and then after that uh, we'll try to to uh, give an explanation on how Indonesia is collaborating uh, regionally in the uh, in the management of tuna fishery and then uh, we'll be closing with a very small taste of what happened with the uh, uh, a little taste of uh, climate change. Uh, due to pandemic uh, of COVID-19 for uh, Indonesian tuna fishery. So um, again, as you know, um, Indonesia is actually the uh, one of the largest uh, world largest producers of tuna and uh, supplying uh, almost 20% uh, of global tuna production. It's so pretty huge and pretty significantly important for in, uh, for the world tuna uh, production um, as also uh, for um, Indonesian uh, Indonesian uh, uh, <clears throat> income for artisanal and also uh, industrial uh, fishery. So again, this tuna, uh, the Indonesian tuna, uh, consisted like uh, somewhere around twenty-two uh, species and are caught by industrial fleets, uh, coastal and artisanal boats. And as you may aware of Indonesian regulation, there uh, there are a separation or uh, segregation on how these uh, fleets is regulated. So uh, uh, zero to uh, zero to five uh, basically is uh, considered as an artisanal or small scale fisheries, and then thirty up uh, gross ton uh, will be considered as a big or industrial uh, fisheries. So all these fishers um, in Indonesia, uh, they are united. Some uh, some of them. Uh, some of them are um, organizing themselves as uh, as uh, association, such as person fishery, for example. So um, <clears throat> before I move, uh, I think I move too fast. So the uh, the uh, the industrial fishery, coastal fishery, and artisanal fishery that are uh, catching or harvesting tuna consisted uh, in a different uh, different type of gears, yeah? Uh, per se, uh, full end line, hand line, and long line. And some of them considered others as like a gill net, for example, but this is not a sort of like a main gears to catch tuna or to harvest tuna. So per se, for example, uh, they are uniting themselves or uh, organizing the setup as ANPN or Himpunan Nelaya, uh, Himpunan, <clears throat> 
nelayan Persin Nusantara, Pol and Line, uh, uh, Pol and Line and Handline, they they have the association of AP2HI that is working closely with IPNLF, and then Long Line, or uh, in here is organized by uh, in, um, uh, Asosiasi Tuna Long Line Indonesia or AFLI that has their headquarters in Bali. So. Um, Again, this is a pretty uh, big uh, commodity that uh, uh, that Indonesia is managing, and uh, eighty thousand fishers. I think uh, most. I think more than eighty thousand uh, fishers actually involved into this, this fishery. As far as export, uh, again, uh, there are plenty of uh, or many type of uh, product that Indonesia exported. Um, what, uh, some of them are uh, in the firm uh, in the form of a frozen skipjack. They uh, we uh, exported to Thailand, Japan, and the Philippines. And for frozen tuna loins, Indonesia actually the largest exporter to USA, Japan, and France. Can skipjack uh, uh, mostly are going to Japan, uh, Middle East, and USA. <clears throat> um, okay, now um, so how. The supply chains of the excuse me, Imam. We, we cannot see your slide well, so would you please to reserve your slides? Um, this, uh, this just uh, stop the side, uh, screen, uh, stop the screen, the share screen, and then you reserve. Okay, hold on. Okay, stop it and reshare it again. Okay, so it's it's it's. How about, what about this? Still, uh, there is a black box. Um, what about this? Um, yeah. Can you see this? The same. The same. Oh, what happened? Um, oh. um, this is a technical. <laughs> I'm sorry about this inconvenience. Um, Okay, now, what what do you see? Um, yeah, black box. Black box again. Okay. <laughs> uh, right I, Mr. Imam Swada, I can see your presentation well in yeah. PowerPoint. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe uh -huh. the connection. Hold on. So. Just to make sure, everybody does. Do have? Is everybody seeing my full screen right now? And there is some there small parts. Uh, it's in black spot. I think uh, we can still see your screen. Uh, we'll be fine. I think. Okay. Um. Do you see, uh, do you see my my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Only small part uh, in a, uh, like a black box. Oh my goodness, uh, what happened, yeah? Um, okay, hold on. Let me try to use a uh, different screen in my computer because, okay. <sighs> um, never happened before. <laughs> so this is the first time that I face this type of disruption in my computer. Um, Hold on. So what happened? What about now? Um, still black box? Yeah, but it's okay. You can continue your talk. Yeah, I think so. Uh, only a small portion in the right side of uh, the screen. Um, so uh, probably, um, so just let me 
probably we can go first with Pak Suadi and I try to uh, restart it my com- uh, restart my computer. Probably that will help to solve the problem. Yeah. Is it is it okay? Because it probably takes a while to restart my computer. Um, Alan, what do you think? Okay, I think it is better to to continue. Okay, please continue your presentation and finish it. Okay. Uh, some some activities is uh, see your presentation well without the box. The box. Some attendees. So, so it is that in, in the, the cases of some uh, attendees, is uh, there is a a black box. But some attendees says, uh, "Okay, there is no black box in the, uh, their computer." Okay. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, you. Uh, um, okay. So <clears throat> let me continue uh, then uh, for this. Um, so again, uh, in the supply chain of uh, Indonesian tuna, um, we we will see from the left side from the fishing company or the fishers, and then move to the right side, which is the landing and trading, followed with the processing and export. So how in brief uh, Indonesian tuna uh, fisheries looks like? So again, um, in Indonesia, uh, probably from 560 to 590. Thousand boats are involved into this fishery, and seventy percent of them is uh, small boats, um, and a lot of them also associated with the fish aggregating device or fats. So, if we ter- if we see that uh, figures, the seventy percent uh, small boats. This is a very alarming, um, actually, for uh, for the mitigation uh, in Indonesian uh, fishery when it's dealing with the climate change. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about it later. What, why this is a very important. So uh, on the landing and trading. So most of the Indonesian fishery, although uh, <clears throat> again because Indonesia is dominated with the small scale fishery, so mostly uh, the coastline is the port. Uh, so uh, basically, the the coastline of Indonesia, uh, all uh, from Sabang to Merauke, is basically a fishing port. But Indonesia also have Three different, um, four different uh, uh, fishing port that officially established the uh, Perika, uh, some uh, <clears throat> OFP or Oceanic Fishing Port, uh, Archipelagic Fishing Port, Coastal Fishing Port, and FLC or Fisheries Landing Center, or we call it TPE. So um, this is uh, this is uh, the the first three: the OFP, the AFP, and CFP is managed by the central government, while while uh, FLC or fishing uh, uh, fish landing center is organized or managed by the uh, provincial level uh, fisheries agency. Um, how to differentiate it? Uh, this is basically based on their services and type of the uh, uh, type of the boats they are uh, uh, docking. <clears throat> and most of the processing uh, is located in East Java, West Java, and some of them is a very well known is uh, Bitung. Um, in Indonesia, there are 700 plus processor, and most of them are in Benua, uh, Benoa, Bali, Bitung, and J- Jakarta. <clears throat> um, this is uh, sort of like a, a little bit uh, taste on who are they. Um, so in the upstream, which is the fishing, collecting, and cold storage, you can see uh, 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 Radio Apirja Sorong, TBN, or Ocean Mitramas, DMB, ISTB, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of them. Some uh, basically um, <clears throat> uh, owning some of the uh, other company as well on the family line. So fishing, fishing and processing, for example, there is a uh, NFI, uh, KCBS, uh, PEE or Primo Indo Ikan downstream processing and downstream on the. Uh, canning. So um, over here, such as RT, SMS, SPFE, and EAP, uh, these are the companies that are exporting the end product to uh, uh, overseas, uh, such as uh, um, Japan, uh, Europe, or USA. <clears throat> um, now, uh, 
again, because tuna is highly migratory species, uh, Indonesia should manage the uh, fisheries in accordance with the uh, regional law. Um, over here, we have uh, um, WCPFC or Western uh, Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, Indian Ocean Tuna Commission or IOTC, and CCSPT. Uh, th those are three different RFMO or uh, Regional Fisheries Management Organization that Indonesia uh, uh, is involved into the uh, into the <coughs> uh, uh, management. But other than this, there is a different type of management in Indonesia is currently initiating. <clears throat> now, um, uh, for the law, a little bit uh, on the law, uh, on how Indonesia is managing their fisheries. Again, the, uh, the, the highest law managing the fishery is a fishery law, uh, number uh, 30, 2004, and 45, 2009. And according uh, to comply with the, uh, with the regional fisheries management organization, then Indonesia has to ratify those, uh, those regulations through presidential regulation or purpose. Um, so basically, Indonesia involved in IOTC in 2007, and CCSPT in 2007. So since 2007, Indonesia paid the membership to RFMO. So Indonesia are legally uh, uh, are legally <clears throat> able to harvest in uh, the tuna and also legally to export the uh, uh, tuna product. So what happened if Indonesia is not joining those regulations? So basically, Indonesia will not be able to export their product and will lose somewhere on. Uh, 500 to 600 million US dollar worth of tuna, uh, export tuna. Um, then uh, after the RFMO, Indonesia also initiating sort of like a ministerial regulation and decree or permit or placement that is issued by the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, such as the uh, fisheries management plan that is specifically managed tuna, cakalang and tongkol, what we call it uh, uh, TCT or tuna, skipjack, and uh, mackerel tuna. And another regulation that also uh, helped to improve the management, such as uh, regulation on VMS, logbook, observer on board, that or the fisher, or fisher's aggregating, uh, fisher, fish aggregating, aggregating device, and, uh, and one more is moratorium of pandasi that is very, uh, <clears throat> very highly um <clears throat> uh, reviewed and looked into the uh, Indonesian tuna initiative um uh, other than those three different uh, uh, three different uh, RFMO Indonesia also managing its fishery uh, um, independently uh, on the in the uh, FMA or fisheries management area or we call it WPP wilayah pengolahan perikanan in 713 714 and 715 so you can see over here 713 between Kalimantan and Sulawesi um, uh, 714 in the Banda Sea and 715 uh, 715 in the uh, in in Maluku Seas yeah so, um, uh, for the 713, 714, and 715, although Indonesia managing uh, independent, in the, independently and right now is uh, formulating the interim harvest strategy, but it has to be compatible with the WCPFC uh, type of regulation in the uh, 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 Central uh, Pacific on the uh, right side over here. And again, um, this type of management or this type of segregation is actually uh, um, is uh, benefiting to Indonesia for the Marine Stewardship Council certification or MSC certification or people will call it like a blue label or something like that. <clears throat> now, um, um, Indonesian fishery. Of, of course, there are a lot, a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of things going on in uh, Indonesian fishery. Uh, when we are dealing with the small scale uh, to uh, big industrial scale uh, fleets, then a lot, a lot of issues uh, that Indonesia has to tackle. But uh, at the moment, there are probably five of uh, focus area that Directorate of Fish. Resources management or uh, SDE uh, belong to uh, DG Capture Fisheries is actually focusing. Um, one of them is, uh, is improving uh, 
data collection uh, and the tuna registration system. You can see how the database sharing system is actually initiated, improvement of logbook and observer, and uh, improvement of licensing such as SRTI, SIMCADA, and small uh, scale fisheries license, <clears throat> and also business license. Um, again, uh, formulation and implemented, implement, implementation of harvest strategy also being uh, the focus of uh, uh, to, uh, uh, Indonesian, to, uh, uh, Indonesian managers, uh, fisheries managers. Uh, uh, they are preparing for the legal documents, um, setting the reference point, monitoring and evaluation. At the moment, they are uh, formulating the harvest strategy based on biological reference point and uh, a little bit this on the uh, maximum, uh, on the sort of like a bioeconomic model that uh, will generate uh, maximum uh, economic yield uh, compared to uh, the uh, biological reference point on the <clears throat> on the uh, regular or or basic uh, population dynamic uh, type of uh, <clears throat> analysis. Um, supported by fish aggregation device management, uh, a lot of a lot of Indonesian fisheries, uh, especially in tuna, uh, pole handline and long, uh, handline, are uh, depending on or dependent on the um, on the uh, fish aggregation device. They need them to basically improve the uh, effectiveness of the gear. Um, again, uh, there is an electronic tuna data reporting, logbook. Uh, Observer and part of this uh, initiative, uh, PNLF, our organization is also supporting uh, DG Capture Fisheries to establish sort of like a, a, a e logbook, so people will be able to um, to uh, register or basically to um, uh, uh, to record uh, their their catch uh, instantly. Amendment uh, on tuna related regulation and inf uh, and uh, development of infrastructures such as landing sites. Again, this is part of the uh, updating uh, tuna management in Indonesia. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, data improvement. Uh, there is a collaborative platform between government uh, offices, uh, either national and also uh, provincial level, uh, NGOs or CSO, uh, CSO scientists, academia. A lot of uh, professors that are doing research also uh, will be able to log in or input their data into BR eBRPL uh, for here. Um, this is a platform of data sharing system that is initiated by uh, TNC and also uh, uh, BRSDM KP or research agency, a research agency in, uh, in the national office. You can see over here how the data is uh, uh, inputted, uh, how the review and how this data will be used for uh, fisheries managers to improve their uh, uh, their regulation. <clears throat> now, um, uh, again, because Indonesia uh, is very complex on uh, when managing uh, fisheries, uh, we cannot uh, overlook or under undermine how uh, is act, uh, how um, small scale actually comes to play in the Indonesian tuna fishery and they are pretty much important so you can see over here on the right side sort of like the supply chain uh, supply chain on or or basically the process of uh, collecting bit until harvesting tuna in small scale fisheries you can see over here that um, although we are uh, we are concentrating in the type of management uh, and data analysis on catch and effort uh, to basically produce MSY or MPY, um, but uh, a different approach that is uh, considering the well-being of Indonesian fishers is also being initiated on how basically um, the fisheries contribute to the lives of individuals and also communities in Indonesia. Um, hence, uh, when uh, Indonesian uh, managers or Indonesian fisheries managers came or come to a decision on how to manage the fishery, it's also considered the well-being of, uh, of the <clears throat> of the fishers, not only the uh, not only the stock itself. <clears throat> hence. Again, social and economic indicators come into play when uh, we are talking about the harvest strategy in uh, Indonesian water for tuna. 
Now, um, now, so when we, uh, the previous one is sort of like a traditional or basically business as usual, or this is uh, something that Indonesia needs to do. But again, this is something that we might to uh, uh, also pay attention that uh, advancing the management should also come from the uh, uh, from the company, the processors, or the fishery itself. That hence, over here, market uh, uh, market driven initiative at the moment is uh, thriving. Why? Because market engagement works. Um, basically, this is the collaboration of uh, processors, fishing, and also uh, exporters, and also market uh, outside the Indonesia. Uh, we see the sustainability of uh, this initiative basically see the sustainability of supply chain, social responsibility, and traceability. Uh, this is the three main uh, important why market-driven initiative uh, is initiated and uh, what uh, the reason behind it. Um, you can see over here uh, sort of like a brand uh, that Paul Enline is uh, promoting Indonesia. Uh, uh, Indonesian tuna. Um, this is the brand Indonesian tuna. Basically, one by one tuna brand. How uh, the Ape Dua Hai or uh, association uh, in a pole and line fisheries uh, try to market their fisheries. Um, and this is something that uh, is uh, very familiar to all of us. The MSC certification. So this is part of the um, <clears throat> how Indonesia. Uh, received a uh, international uh, appreciation on uh, the improvement uh, on its fishery. Again, uh, for the social uh, responsibilities, some of us uh, already moved toward fair trade fishery certification um, uh, to see the welfare of the fisher uh, <clears throat> through the uh, very uh, very basic rules, which is the fishers uh, in. In, in the coastal area. <clears throat> now, um, just a little bit about uh, MSC certification to uh, you that uh, is not uh, familiar yet. Uh, so basically, the MSC certification should, uh, is going uh, to make sure basically how uh, uh, fish is catch uh, from, from the ocean and uh, basically uh, serve to your plate. So. Uh, every single bite of fish that you eat basically traceable to where the fisherman caught the fish. Um, there is a term uh, for that, a, uh, to initiate that uh, uh, MSC certification. Um, you have to define what type of species, what type of gear that they are, you are using, um, where the fish uh, uh, is caught and then coming from which uh, boats that is certif uh, certified through these uh, uh, mechanism, or you have to pass the uh, P1 or sustainable fish stocks, uh, P2 minimizing environmental uh, impacts, or P3 effective uh, fisheries management. So these three principles are the base of uh, MSC certification. <clears throat> now um, in Indonesia, you. Um, uh, basically, we have to define unit of uh, unit of assessment for uh, to to uh, to achieve or to get the MSC certification. Uh, currently, there are twenty seven total of UOA for tuna uh, for N line, uh, specifically for for N line, and currently uh, fourteen of UOAs or unit unit of assessment is under a, a full assessment of uh, MSC, seven geographic location, uh, you can see on, on the right side, Banda, Flores, uh, Entebbe, North Flores, and also Maluku. Uh, so mostly in eastern part of Indonesia, 713, 714, and 715 uh, fisheries management area. <clears throat> So uh, to have certification, of, uh, MSC certificate, you have to be very, uh, very distinct or very specific. You have to define your tuna products, gear type, location, and you have to know the volumes uh, to see whether it is viable or not. Um, and uh, again, uh, those type of uh, progress, uh, once you are uh, fully assessed, then uh, you have to basically improve your your uh, 
uh, fisheries. And uh, here um, there is a sort of like um, independent uh, independent review or independent platform that you can see how Indonesian fishery improvement program uh, progressing uh, in uh, <coughs> in the oceanic type of uh, fishery uh, tuna over here until uh, sort of like uh, uh, um, coastal such as uh, grouper and also uh, blue swimming crab or rajuman. <clears throat> um, a little bit on how these SM, uh, Indonesian M uh, uh, MSC certification process, it's not a, uh, it's not easy as snipping, uh, snapping a finger. Uh, Again, this is this initiative has been started from 2018, and hopefully by the end of 2020, um, uh, there will be more MSC certified uh, fish or tuna from Indonesian fishery. Currently, we have at least two uh, MSC uh, labeled uh, in Sorong uh, that at Henline Fisheries and also other one in in Buru Island. So there are two and hopefully uh, more coming to uh, Indonesian market over here. Then we'd like also to talk a little bit on the uh, social uh, <coughs> response, uh, social, so, uh, social sustainability manifesto. So basically uh, this is a <coughs> um, collective voice from <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, from uh, from the processors or and a fishing industry uh, that is member of IPNLF. Um, so basically, they want to have a distinct um, a distinct product where their product is uh, <coughs> socially responsible. Um, <coughs> so minimizing environmental effect, involving human in the fisheries, aligning aligning with the. <coughs> Uh, SDGs or or <clears throat> sustainable development goals, and a lot of them uh, is actually preserving the old centuries of how uh, the community the community is uh, fishing uh, tuna in in their respective location. Um, <clears throat> now a little bit uh, taste. So this is not complete without uh, seeing a little bit taste on how uh, climate change and tuna fishery. Uh, in Indonesia gonna look like again uh, Pak Dekan or the Dean mentioned on how these uh, climate change will affect the water temperature currents uh, current strength uh, dissolved oxygens and primary production and what is actually uh, what is what is gonna happen uh, when this change the uh, properties of our ocean so there is a, a bit there is a small study which is uh, um, stating 15% of uh, tuna biomass will move to from EEZ, EEZ or uh, economic zone uh, to high seas, um, so which is a big problem for Indonesia because then, uh, as I mentioned before, 70% of our fishers or our fishery for tuna is actually based on the coastal. So Indonesia will need a bigger boat, uh, will need a mitigation plan uh, on how uh, Indonesia uh, should advocate the small fishers and how industry prepare themselves to go uh, much further to uh, high seas to catch their tuna. And again, uh, you can see how the economic losses is going to be potentially affecting the, uh, the coastal fisheries, changing the demographic uh, in the coastal fisheries and uh, a lot more actually uh, will be <clears throat> affecting by the climate change. And again, um, as we know, the uh, uh, the in the beginning of um, 2020, we were shocked by the pandemic uh, COVID uh, COVID 19. Yeah, um, and uh, a lot of a lot of us blaming to the uh, climate change. And look, this is what happened with the climate change on tuna fishery. So the drop price, uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, for one day fishing, uh, it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> is a seeing uh, in the eastern part of Indonesia. Um, uh, drop in processing company, reduction by, uh, to 50 percent of the capacity uh, in the factory. They are not able, uh, they're not able to uh, basically uh, send their product to the uh, 
to overseas. Uh, direct uh, now they are looking for direct sales. How their uh, <clears throat> their uh, they actually supplying their product to a domestic market. But again, uh, tuna um, is uh, well some which uh, for some of us tuna is uh, quite expensive, and <clears throat> and this certainly will uh, give some. Some severe effect uh, to uh, coastal uh, <clears throat> coastal uh, communities in Indonesia. A little bit on that, and again, uh, like to thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, present this. Um, in here, uh, we are collaborate. Uh, <clears throat> I am working uh, under IPNLF, and we are strongly collaborate. Uh, collaborated with the collaborating with AP, AP2HI or Asosiasi Perikanan Pol and Line Indonesia and promoting uh, Indonesian tuna um, uh, for uh, domestic and also for international market. Having said that, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for Mr. Imam Suhada. As we know, tuna is one of important fish and become commercially. <coughs> and for the last speakers, uh, Mr. Suadi will present about improving fisheries management policy through the lens of fish supply chain management. He is a lecturer of fisheries department and interest in some issues about empowerment of fisheries resources, fisheries economy, and rural development. So for Mr. Suadi, time is yours. Thank you, uh, moderator. And thank you, Palim Mansriza, for inviting me to this event. Uh, in fact, um, the title is uh, Climate Change uh, Issues, uh, but uh, I have to apologize that um, I'm not uh, doing uh, so many activities related uh, with the issues. So that's why I try to shift my talk uh, to the what I'm uh, doing right now. Uh, well, let me share my screen. Uh, wait a moment, please. Oops. Okay. Um, it is nice uh, to hear uh, Bloon and uh, Pa Imam uh, presentation. Uh, it is very enlightening and uh, very nice uh, talk, nice structure uh, talk uh, about the issue. I just um, probably will talk much more uh, wider issues uh, about the fisheries management. Uh, I think uh, Pa Imam has mentioned a lot about uh, how our fisheries management in Indonesia. Uh, in the last uh, uh, few couple of years, uh, we are doing research in uh, supply chain management, uh, in fact. Uh, and I think uh, I'm trying to see the possibility of uh, improving the fisheries management policy, particularly uh, to, um, through the lens of supply chain management. Uh, there are four parts that I would like to share, a uh, little bit introduction, and then uh, key issues in fisheries management. And uh, fourth, uh, the main uh, part that I would like uh, to discuss, uh, hopefully I can make uh, faster and a brief uh, uh, the issues. Well, uh, as an introduction, um, as uh, we know, I think uh, the fisheries uh, play an enormous role to, for in the context of Indonesia and many other countries, whether as the main income source of the people and even the nation, uh, jobs, food, and don't, uh, we also have to mention as a feed, um, uh, as a main uh, raw material for uh, feed of uh, animal, including fish. And for sure, it's an engine of gro for growth and there is a lot of discussion about the issue of uh, sovereignty, uh, national security, including the issue of IU fishing. And um, 
I think uh, in a social aspect, uh, historically, this is very important uh, activities for many of uh, Indonesian communities. Uh, I think uh, because of the historical recent, uh, some of traditional fishing uh, uh, activities, even in other countries, uh, some of our fishermen can do that. And the last one is uh, as uh, uh, cultural uh, base of some part of Indonesia. Uh, so that's why this is a protect uh, coastal culture. And that's why in the context of uh, role, its role, fisheries, I think, uh, um, has uh, multifunctionality. And the issue of multifunctionality has to be put in front uh, in any of uh, Indonesian activities, including facing the problem when we face, let's say, WTO uh, in debating about the subsidy and so on. So uh, this is how important the fisheries is. And uh, I think uh, fisheries management, uh, yeah, uh, when we're studying fisheries management, uh, we always could uh, FIO uh, define as the integration process. Uh, the integration process of what? Of information, gathering, analysis, planning, consultation, decision making, and allocation of resources, and then formulation and implementation. Yeah, so the fisheries management is an integrated process. This is uh, uh, one of uh, important part of the definition uh, to ensure uh, two things, I think. Uh, the continued uh, productivity of the fisheries for sure and the accomplishment of other fisheries objective. So the second objective, I think, is really broad. Uh, and I think the issue of multifunctionality of fisheries uh, could be in that uh, objective. And why fisheries management so important recently? I think uh, uh, Iman also has mentioned uh, many of the issues. And um, for sure, the stock declining uh, due to the increasing exploitation and the pressure on various uh, fish stock. But the interesting thing is uh, when we uh, see the stock assessment, uh, we compare stock assessment 2011 and 2016 and the recent 2017, uh, we found that our stock is still uh, big in a number and even increase. Even though I think uh, this is of uh, the improvement in methodology of the assessment. So uh, our stock is uh, are still, uh, let's say, we're still very large in amount, uh, in the volume uh, of uh, fish stock. Now we have, uh, uh, we always hear about, we have about 12.5 million ton of uh, fish stock and our uh, capture fisheries just exploited 6.5 uh, million ton. That's why we still have room to expand the fisheries. But on the other hand, uh, we found also this uh, figure in which uh, the red color indicating the overexploitation of uh, fishery resources emerging everywhere in Indonesia. The green one is uh, still, let's say, under to moderate uh, exploitation. It's uh, very rare in many of areas of Indonesia in Indonesia and also in many other countries. Uh, and that's why if we are open to the every report of FAO, let's say Sofia, FAO, FAO Sofia 2020, uh, still the level of exploitation of the uh, fishery is about 90 million tons. Uh, so this is the issue, the increasing of uh, fish stock uh, exploitation. Uh, uh, and the second issue is, uh, I think Pak Imam has mentioned uh, a lot about uh, the certification. So the public awareness and concern on the sustainable use of the resources. So this really uh, getting increase and increase uh, the people demand on the sustainability, even though uh, uh, we, we, all, we always read uh, this is a figure I take uh, from reddit.com. Uh, they put the name, uh, uh, the title of uh, this, uh, on this article, 
with the jungle of certification because there are a lot of uh, certification that has been completed by many of uh, fishing industry, not only fishery, in, in fact, in many other uh, natural based resources activities, they need a lot of kind of certification. But the main point is people demand on the sustainability has been voiced very strong. So sustainability is the key issue on fisheries management. Even though we understand the key issues in fisheries management, uh, uh, for sure the high uncertainty, uh, the debate uh, the, or the discussion about the property regime that applied in fisheries, as we always mention as open access or, or common property, even this is, the word is uh, have a different meaning, but we always say the property regime that apply to fisheries is open access. And that's why I ended with the problem uh, maybe 60 or 60 years ago, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. In 1968, uh, uh, Garrett Hardy mentioned the strategy of the commons. Or even the fisheries development policy also create the problem that lead to the tragedy of the commons. In the table uh, on the right side, we can see, uh, I try to analyze uh, long uh, data how the trend of uh, a growth of uh, production, uh, fishers, uh, fishing vessels, and productivity, uh, in which uh, the growth of the productivity tend to slow down. That means we, we have uh, an issue of uh, uh, the two issues that I mentioned previously. So the management of fisheries basically, uh, uh, this is a like lecture. <laughs> I say, uh, basically, uh, based on the, this uh, model, simple model. Uh, so if you see a fish stock uh, in the ocean, then we will see that uh, the stock may be getting bigger individually, we, we call growth, or in a number, getting a large number because of recruitment. Or the, it also can be smaller in number due to natural mortality or even decrease due to fishing mortality. In fisheries management, uh, we are, in our understanding, mostly we are trying to manage uh, the F or fishing mortality, whatever the model is, uh, whether we call it uh, MSY, uh, MEIY, maximum social yield, basically based on the F or fishing mortality. So that's why we see many of uh, reference that uh, uh, we see the relationship between the yield and effort. Uh, this, uh, this figure shows the total uh, uh, biomass and we calculate the maximum sustainable yield but also this figure we can see individual or uh, in total. Uh, there are a lot of discussion about uh, this figure, but uh, let me skip just to say that uh, basically based on biological consideration, we, we try to find the highest uh, yield, the maximum sustainable yield that we can produce from effort or any of input that we used uh, in uh, fishing activities. And then uh, the discussion of uh, fisheries management, uh, there are a lot of criticize among uh, those models, uh, but uh, the first model uh, here, basically on biological aspect has been criticized uh, due to the benefit or the value in economic or economic rent. And if we calculate uh, uh, whether if we produce lots maximum yield is it will give us a maximum economic yield and the model said uh, no we have to uh, uh, manage fisheries lower uh, than the MSY to get uh, maximum economic yield and then those discussion if we are lower the uh, production or the economic yield that's mean we have to lower the effort so we have to reduce the number of effort. Reducing the number of effort means that we reduce input 
in reducing the fees. If the number of effort means the number of people working in fisheries, so that means we have to reduce the number of fisheries in fisheries. This is the three uh, basic model of uh, fisheries management. Even though inside the model, uh, this is, uh, I think uh, I had, uh, I tried to summarize from many of uh, fisheries policy uh, that uh, written in many of uh, ministry decree uh, in uh, fisheries, how we manage uh, technically uh, uh, fisheries, whether we using PAC, total allowable catch, we regulate the species, size, gear, fishing grown or fishing vessel. So basically, as I mentioned previously, we manage the fish, we manage the F or fishing mortality through by the total allowable catch and so on. But we rarely manage uh, the product of the fish. Let's say species, we will prohibit it to selling the certain species because of the for exploitation or the size. Uh, but the last uh, interesting policy is the regulation of the size that can be sold uh, for lobster. So this is the, the, the technically aspect of the fisheries uh, management. Now those approach, has been criticized uh, much more uh, by uh, many of uh, researchers, many of uh, uh, re researchers in fisheries management. In the first uh, approach that I mentioned previously, uh, we call it a modern approach. So we see the relationship between the usage or the fishing activities to gain the optimal, whatever the optimal is, either optimizing the exploitation or reducing the conflict or mitigating the pollution. But uh, postmodern approach so that another relationship, the first relation is interaction with the global change. As I think uh, uh, Brune has introduced us about the how the global change which influenced the uh, fisheries in the macro level. Uh, so this is one of uh, challenge or opportunity for us doing research in uh, fisheries management. And the second is the interaction with the globalization. Uh, as as uh, we know that fisheries is uh, highly traded commodities or uh, we can say uh, people producing uh, fish it must be for selling, not for consume by themselves. Uh, so this is uh, uh, how the fisheries management see uh, the potential or, or criticize the, the, the other uh, basic of uh, fisheries uh, management. And to integrate uh, many of you, there are a lot of approach, whether we call it co-management, Pumoroyen uh, web, mentioned as co-management or other uh, approach that see the need for new model of uh, fisheries management. And uh, I think uh, this is basically, uh, it is needed uh, because uh, as I mentioned previously that fisheries is a business, uh, fisheries as business system. In our uh, law of uh, fisheries number 45, 2009, we see the definition uh, as uh, activities related with the management and utilization of fish resources and so on, uh, performed in a fishery business system. So uh, that's why I'm thinking about um, how possible it is uh, to see those this definition and the definition of management and the possibility to integrate uh, with the definition of uh, uh, supply chains. So why uh, it is important? Because uh, if you make uh, uh, categorize uh, this definition to simple group, we will see the group uh, of uh, fishery resources is uh, one element. The second element is the activity of exploiting the fishery. 
and then we will bring to handling and processing activities to produce uh, uh, value added product and then end up uh, at the market. We that uh, for sure it will be related uh, with uh, also supporting uh, infrastructure, policy, finance, and, and so on. So this uh, definition, I think, is really related uh, with the definition of uh, supply chains, in which uh, Borsok and at all uh, in supply, supply chain management and logistics uh, define the, the supply chains as the sequence of business process and information that provide a product or service from supplier through manufacturing and distribution to, to, to ultimate consumer, uh, customer. So that that's that's uh, that's definition seems uh, very close to each other. Uh, fisheries management, uh, fisheries itself, and uh, supply chains, uh, in which the uh, objective also also similar. In which the integrated value chains uh, may, uh, also uh, aims to get effectiveness, efficiency, relevancy, and sustainability. So I think uh, there is a somehow similarity in the definition. And that's why we need to manage well management, well manage uh, uh, the flow of uh, whether flow of information, product, or even finance. Uh, usually we, we I, uh, if we read the supply chain uh, handbook, uh, at least three main flow that we need to well manage. So uh, the last part that I would like uh, to share, I think uh, my time is run out. Uh, uh, the problem of uh, fisheries management from the perspective of the supply chains. Uh, the first case is from lobster uh, supply chains model uh, at southern coast of Java that we are conducting studies in the last couple of years. And anchovy supply chains uh, model, this is related uh, to the prohibition of trolling. Uh, the first one related to the uh, management of the size. Uh, and the last one, I think I will not discuss much more about this, but uh, Imam has mentioned a lot about uh, the tuna. Uh, but this is related to the, to the issue of moratorium of uh, uh, fishing in uh, Bitung. So uh, the lobster uh, fisheries is very important uh, in southern coast of Java. I just uh, will skip it, uh, this one. What's the challenge in uh, managing the, the, the lobster fisheries uh, from the perspective of supply chains? Uh, the left side figure shows us the, the model of uh, fish supply to the main uh, industry or market uh, in in the certain area of where the fish is uh, exploited. Uh, we are conducting studies in uh, Yogyakarta, in Pangandaran, and, and also in uh, East Java. So we we, are, we see that the blue one is the allowable size regulated by uh, decree of uh, Ministry of uh, Marine Affairs and Fisheries that must be a length minimum of eight centimeter. So many of uh, fisheries that related to the out region or export market will go to the blue line. But even there is a prohibition, there is also some issues related with the local uh, or domestic market. They will challenge the, uh, how to say, the enforcement uh, in the definition of fisheries management in uh, lobster management. But unfortunately, uh, the the law uh, or the regulation has been changed uh, recently, uh, previously eight uh, centimeter and now reduced for certain species uh, to six centimeter. Um, so this is one issue just uh, to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, the problem. And the second issue is uh, related with lobster service. We also uh, try to analyze uh, the Regulation number 12 of 2020 on the uh, lobster 
uh, management. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there are some species uh, that has been reduced the size from eight to six, and the permission for any other of activities uh, that previously prohibited, for example, poor release export or uh, culture. Uh, and we, we, we are trying to identify whether possibility of, of uh, creating new problem in uh, lobster uh, resources. And we found some, some issues uh, that we are right uh, in the red one. Uh, could be the issues uh, when we, are, we want to export the lobster, what is the quota? Do we know the stock? Uh, this, that's one of the issues. Uh, the second issue is uh, related uh, uh, just uh, about the anchovy is related with the um, prohibition of using uh, uh, throw related fishing gear. Uh, this is uh, uh, in North uh, Sumatra in Medan. There are, uh, I just uh, will go fast. Uh, there are two uh, supply chains uh, model, but the main market is the uh, city market. The main market of uh, uh, the main target uh, market for the anchovies uh, or three uh, is uh, the city market in Medan City. Uh, there are two, uh, how to say, uh, there are uh, two ways. Uh, first is uh, from fisher to their uh, village or home, and then directly sell to collector. And the second is uh, to companies, and then companies uh, to the uh, main market, or even some companies are sent to out region. What we would do? Uh, the thing that we want to highlight from this uh, case is um, the prohibition of the uh, use of the fishing gears and impacted the way of uh, this uh, flow of uh, uh, anchovy. The last one uh, is related with the tuna uh, in Bitung uh, city. Uh, where the major industry of uh, large scale uh, fish processing in Indonesia, uh, particularly canning and so on, is uh, in Bitung. That has been uh, severe impact by the prohibition uh, of um, uh, foreign or ex foreign uh, fishing vessels uh, or other uh, policy during uh, previous uh, minister. So, uh, but uh, how the industry manage the issues is uh, uh, one of uh, the important issues is uh, try to find out the main source of the fishery to process. For example, the, some industries importing fish uh, because of their lack of uh, uh, source of uh, raw material. So, uh, as a conclusion, uh, I think uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, supply chain, as I mentioned uh, before, there are a lot of uh, issues about uh, how to ensure the sustainability in any of uh, uh, sector or any of uh, component that uh, I mentioned in the fishery business system. I think uh, Pa Imam has mentioned a lot about in the uh, upstream side, uh, the fisher, the fish, the fishing boat, whether even uh, logbook and so on, uh, Pa Imam has mentioned uh, a lot about that. Uh, and also some of uh, project has been put, like MSC has mentioned previously, certification issues at the upstream. Uh, the third party uh, for sure, not the compulsory certification, but the third party certification. And in the middle also, uh, there will be need some of uh, such a certification as the end consumer now demand the, of uh, the sustainability product. Uh, and for sure the issues are mo mostly related to the quantity, quality, continuity, 
And one important issue recently rising in fisheries management is traceability. I think that's all uh, my presentation. Uh, as closing remark, uh, fisheries is still important, as I mentioned previously. Uh, and uh, fisheries management, uh, I think, need to also focus not only upstream or supply side, uh, but also to the other related actors uh, in managing the fisheries. And the last part, smart fisheries, it seems to uh, rapidly growing uh, recently in uh, here uh, in ministry, we have Nayan Pintar. Uh, in sub, uh, supply chain, they also have uh, um, uh, uh, IT-based uh, information system. But um, as a learning a source, I'm uh, um, it is very interesting if uh, friends uh, see the seafood chain Unisot or uh, tuna scoop. The tuna scoop one is really, really interesting uh, how Japanese company uh, manage the quality and traceability of uh, tuna fishery. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the model how to integrate uh, the fishery management into uh, fishery supply chain management system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for Mr. Swati for your presentation about fisheries management. And yeah, I will continue to the next section. So all the participants, if you have a question, you can ask to the speakers. And now we have um, five questions, three for Mrs. Plan. Two for Mr. Imam and one for Mr. Suati. Okay, and there is a question from Ibu Rati Ida Adarini for Dr. Pluen. Can we know how many percent the contribution from naturogenic and anthropogenic for climate change globally? And then the second question is from Dr. Umi Zakia for Mrs. Pluen. Um, in the term of law itself, which one is more affected? The existing law, ocean law due to climate change or vice versa. And since the ocean condition and territory are different in every country, will the rule applied will be same or different? How about the open ocean, which which is open territory, who actually should manage or was it law existing in this era? And then in the third question for Dr. Plun is from Riza. How intense the discussion about the effect of global change from perspective in international law in what topic the discussion is intense? Uh, maybe Dr. Tuen can answer first for the question. Yes, please. Do you want to answer all the questions straight away? Oh, yes, I can do so. Um, concerning the first question, if I understood well, it's mostly relying on natural versus anthropogenic climate change. So I, I would say I'm not a scientific by training. I only know that the oceanic system is the largest active and natural sink and reservoir of greenhouse gases. So uh, due to physical earth sea flux at the ocean surface and active biological uptake, I think that is approximately a quarter of CO2 emission of anthropogenic origin that has that have been absorbed by the ocean since 19. And as for the XS excess heat, it's all about 90% of the excess heat that have been absorbed between 70 and 2017. 
Um, I invite the, the person who asked me the question to look into the IPCC special report on the ocean and climate sphere in a, a cryosphere in a changing climate to, to look at the difference between natural and anthropogenic climate change. I have only one example con concerning uh, um, weather events, and as for 2019, 70% of weather events that have been assessed uh, have their likelihood or magnitude increased by human influence on, on climate. So it's really important. Um, concerning the second question, so various aspects of ocean law can be affected by climate change. For example, sea level rise is impacting uh, due to the calculation of baselines that states use to, uh, to determine the extent of na national waters, such as archipelagic waters or the EEZ. Uh, for sure, uh, international law is not disconnected uh, with the national circumstances. So uh, the, the national uh, territories or circumstances between arch archipelagic or coastal states or long land stakes will be quite different. Um, so international law is relying on sovereign states and how they implement uh, it. So it will be accommod accommodated to national circumstances, legal systems and capacities. I know that under the Paris Agreement, for example, uh, what is called nationally determined contributions, so under Article 3 and 4, are mostly based in regards of mitigation and adaptation to climate change. They are mostly based on national circumstances and how the state uh, envision um, climate action. And they are free somehow to integrate ocean-related rules such as um, coastal management, um, uh, weather events such as uh, heat um, waves in the ocean and so on in their nationally determined contribution. This is the same for adaptation in national adaptation plans. Um, as for international areas, so beyond national jurisdiction, there is an ongoing negotiation, as I said in my presentation, on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity, but it is still unclear how states will accommodate it, it uh, with uh, the fight against climate change. Um, at that point, it's really um, minor. So uh, international law, it's still hard to, to combine different uh, aspects. So it's still fragmented in that way. And you have to keep in mind that there are already existing agreements overlapping somehow in uh, sometimes in uh, international areas, such as regional um, um, regional fisheries agreement or um, uh, sea uh, protection, such as in the Mediterranean or in South Asia. Uh, regarding the last question, how intense uh, the discussion about the effect of global change is from a, an international law perspective and what topics the discussion is intense about. There are a lot of hot topics, for example, acidification due to scientific uncertainty. It's still hard for decision makers to address this aspect within both uh, law of the sea or climate law. Uh, even if there, there is a lot of uh, impacts, such as on fisheries, so it's still hard. And there are quite a lot of topics, um, hot topics regarding what kind of solution we are um, we, we need to use to fight climate change. That, must that be naturally based solutions, such as blue, blue carbon ecosystem, or uh, technologically based solutions, such as geoengineering? Uh, which is for sure raising a lot of questions about the impacts of such activities, both on the environment and on uh, relying um, coastal or national communities. Uh, there is also a hot topic about fundings, for sure, and also about the share of burden, because this is mostly uh, historical, so-called historical, uh, historical, historical uh, emitters, 
uh, that are uh, responsible for anthropogenic climate change. So it must be also accommodated with the economy and national security and national inter uh, interests. So I hope that I answered the, the question. I tried to, to do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much for your private and clear answer. And the next question for Mr. Imam. There are two questions from Octias Muzaki. Uh, how Indonesian government anticipate of global climate change on CTC production in the future? And the second question is from Pak Riza. What is the main obstacle is getting the MCS certificate? Can small scale fisheries cope with the requirements? Mm, okay, please answer the question, Mr. Imam. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> thank you uh, for the question. So uh, we'll answer the first one, the, the easiest first. Uh, so whether the small-scale fisheries are able to um, <clears throat> to receive uh, MSC certification. Um, so in fact, uh, the first MSC certified fish uh, in Indonesia came from, um, from the very... Uh, East of Indonesia, the uh, from Sorong, um, Citra Raja Ampat, <clears throat> Kenning, uh, which is um, the company who are harvesting skipjack tuna and also yellowfin tuna and <clears throat> using uh, hook and line. So yes, uh, there is a possibility for a small scale fishery to receive uh, MSC certification. So that's the first in Indonesia and also in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, from small-scale fishery that is certified under MSC certification. Uh, another, uh, another also in Buru, uh, Buru Island <clears throat> is, uh, um, I believe, from uh, PT Harta, uh, Harta Samudra, also coming from headline fisheries, um, with small-scale fisheries, and is also certified uh, under uh, MSC certification. <clears throat> the second uh, question uh, uh, from Pa. Octias, yeah. Um, is there any mitigation or plan for Indonesia uh, on the uh, climate change effect of the fisheries? Well, um, uh, it's 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 like um, <clears throat> it's like addressing um, addressing something. Which one is actually a very important uh, to the fisheries? Um, right now, um, again, it's also correlated uh, <clears throat> with the MSC. Uh, most of the most of the difficulties to conduct stock assessment is the uh, data because we don't have enough data or there is uh, the data is very poor. Um, and um, for Indonesia, I think the best way or the best action to basically move forward to, or advancing their fisheries management is to improve the data collection. Um, and here, um, um, not only uh, Indonesia is uh, uh, improving uh, the data collection, but also parallelly with the uh, strengthening the market-driven policy and market-driven improvement of their of their uh, of their fisheries. Um, for again, um, is Indonesia um, not preparing for the climate change? Not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I can. I cannot say the same answer because Indonesia also looking at the possibility of going to the high seas uh, to uh, um, for for some of the big industry to go there and harvest uh, some of the fish. But uh, for now, I don't think that will be a big uh, a big uh, a focus or a focus area of Indonesia to go to that uh, a certain level. Um, now, uh, concentrating on the problem, and I think uh, the DG Capture Fisheries has been very aggressive on improving their data collection. Um, um, they are involving a stakeholders, NGO, uh, a university, and also their research agency to make the, uh, the data reliable and also in high quality uh, as possible. <clears throat> so that's the answer probably. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much for your answer, Mr. Imam Suhada. And the last question is for Mr. Suadi from Dr. Umi Zakia. She is uh, asked something the rule apply 
rate for breaking law significantly by other fishermen were different in each different country. Is true or how then Indonesia government opinion regarding this issue? Okay, please, Mr. Suadi, answer this question. Still mute. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bu Umi. Uh, I hope I can explain uh, your questions uh, related to the breaking law accidentally. Uh, uh, probably the case uh, that uh, you mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, our fishermen uh, entering Australia, some part of Australia, uh, by incident, probably, uh, do you mean, uh, or, or other part uh, of uh, uh, fishing area? Uh, I think uh, it could be happened uh, uh, if uh, we list uh, some of incidents uh, uh, in uh, how to say, uh, how our fish are catch by other region uh, or other countries uh, due to, they said, violation of uh, certain. Uh, areas. Uh, if I follow the other discussion to, uh, with uh, those who involve in many of uh, studies in the border areas, uh, particularly uh, in the marine, uh, marine or uh, ocean law, uh, sometimes also there are, uh, how to say, uh, unclear definition of the border. Uh, there is a make uh, such even uh, such of uh, incident occurred. Uh, and uh, the second question is related uh, with uh, uh, what's the position of our government related to this issue. And I think uh, we, if you follow the news, uh, for sure, uh, there are also some effort uh, from our government to uh, protect those kids. Uh, even though uh, I found a very nice uh, example uh, uh, when I studied in uh, Japan a few couple of years ago, when the fishermen from uh, China face uh, with the fishermen from uh, Japan. And uh, in the House of Representatives also discussed about that, how important to protect their uh, fishermen. Uh, in every news also, we see how uh, they are trying to uh, strengthen to protect uh, their uh, fishermen. Uh, I think uh, related uh, with the issue, the government, uh, how to say, uh, the government position or the government role, uh, we, we, we see the, uh, the strong effort from the government to protect our uh, fishermen. But the problem is uh, uh, mostly the size of uh, our fishing vessels is uh, still uh, lack or weak. And uh, it is, uh, I think uh, the other priority, the other the other strategy uh, to benefit the uh, resources, uh, try to shift uh, from nine, 96 percent. If I count our current fisheries uh, is a small scale, trying to be uh, promoted to be larger fisheries as one of uh, effort uh, to strengthen the uh, fisheries uh, activities. I hope I. Answering your question, Bu Umi. Thank you. Thank you very much for Mr. Suadi. I think all the question has been answered by all the speakers. Is there any question from another participants? I will wait for five minutes later. If there is no question, I will close the discussion today. Um, I think 
there is no question. So thank you very much for joining and coming. Thank you very much for the keynote speaker, Mrs. Blaine, Mr. Imam Shuhada, Mr. Soati, and all of the participants that are joining us. And hopefully we can do the next discussion. And let's keep the fishery sustainable. Mm, I think that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon all. Okay. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank